to start off our conversation, what trends do you see in terms of digital transformation taking place in Sri Lanka right now? Yeah, I think as you correctly said, I think digital transformation has been there for quite a long time within the organization and we're trying to implement. So the digital transformation means many things to many people because it's a journey that an organization or a country or an individual taking uh, into their hands in terms of transforming them digitally. Uh, if you take the industries or the organization, it is accelerating uh, from an organization's perspective in almost in all the sectors, uh, particularly in the banking and finance, especially and telecommunication and retail. We have seen a big trend of adoption with e-commerce and banking apps uh, coming into play in the digital transformation space. Of course, uh, when it comes to the small and medium scale companies, they use digital in a, as I started with saying that it is a journey at early stages of the journey they are in. But I think there's a long way to go in terms of the SME sector if you really look at it. Digital transformation has been a buzzword for quite a while, but what does it really mean? We spoke to Conrad Dice about it. Stay tuned. Some bonds give more returns, get more security and more interest on your fixed deposits from Sri Lanka's largest finance company, LOLC Finance. The latest issue of LMD is available at lmdmall.lk as well as selected supermarkets and bookshops. You can also access the digital version on Press Reader, Maxter, our social media platforms and WhatsApp. Hello and welcome to LMD TV. The topic of conversation today is digital transformation and we are in conversation with the chairman of LOLC Finance and founder of iPay, Conrad Dias. Mr. Dias, it's lovely to have you on our show. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here with LMD TV contributing to the subject matter of digital. To start off our conversation, what trends do you see in terms of digital transformation taking place in Sri Lanka right now? Yeah, I think as you correctly said, I think digital transformation has been there for quite a long time within the organization and we're trying to implement. And uh, it was a challenge to identify for the organization what this means. Uh, so the digital transformation means many things to many people because it's a journey that an organization or a country or an individual taking uh, into their hands in terms of transforming them digitally. So when it comes to the Sri Lankan market as Sri Lanka, if you really look at it in today's context, even every political forum is talking about digital, right? So I think that's a good sign. I think that's a trend that it, it, we have seen now, everyone, uh, irrespective of the party, irrespective of which uh, group they are belonging to, they're all talking about digital is very important for the country. So that's, that's a very big trend that I see uh, from a trend perspective. Of course, uh, uh, if you take the industries or the organization, uh, it is accelerating uh, from an organization's perspective um, in, in, in almost in all the sectors, uh, particularly in the banking and finance, especially, and telecommunication and retail. We have seen a big trend of adoption with e-commerce and banking apps uh, coming into play in the digital transformation space. We are digitally enabling uh, the products and services uh, for their customers. So I think uh, there is a significant increase in adoption by the companies. Of course, there is a story about the adoption by the people. I think we'll uh, come back to you. But I think uh, uh, the the largely this was driven uh, by or, or rather the kick started with the pandemic to a greater extent for mere survival that the people have to adopt digital. So the adoption has been there. So that that gave a uh, uh, that gave that push for digital. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, the government front or the regulatory front, also if you look at the Lanka Pay, 
and the national payment platform uh, have been instrumental in driving uh, digital, especially on the financial services sector uh, with the public-private partnerships that they have established in order to um, push digital transactions in the banking and financial sector. And not only that, when uh, it comes to the government payments, uh, Lanka Pay has taken a big role in terms of in introducing the at least the payment side of digitization for the government bodies, including Pradeshya Sabhas to uh, municipal council and various other government institutes, including tax department being uh, digitized with the payment. So I think that's something that which we see as a big trend. Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to the small and medium scale companies, I think I, I feel they're still lagging behind to a certain extent uh, that we see even in our engagement with our customers. Uh, so they use digital in a, as I started with saying that it is a journey at early stages of the journey they are in. Uh, so they are doing uh, probably a little bit of I would say social commerce transactions with the Facebook being one of the heavily used platform and uh, many uh, many e-commerce uh, kind of in entry level e-commerce uh, transactions are happening in the in the digital space and of course uh, mostly now they are enabled with payments to a greater extent but I think there is a long way to go in in terms of the SME uh, sector if you really look at it. And if I ask you, what is your assessment of the digital transformation landscape of Sri Lanka, especially focusing on the financial services sector? Are we progressing fast enough? Okay. So uh, as a sector, if I may answer the, from a banking and financial services company's perspective or the bank's perspective, I think every bank, every financial services company is having some form of digital presence and digital transaction enablement. I think most of the fi financial services and the banking apps promote digital payments and we are actually as wallets and we do have a platform called iPay, which is the mostly used platform in Sri Lankan market for just pay as well. So uh, the mobile wallets uh, driven banking apps are very popular and they have the solutions, uh, if I may say. But uh, adoption, I think as uh, we compared with the rest of the market or rest of the world, if you take our neighboring countries like India, uh, where the QR based payment is uh, the predominant payment mechanism, especially for small value transactions. But in Sri Lanka, we have not gone there yet. Uh, even though Central Bank, together with Lanka Pay, introduced the Lanka QR scheme in 2019. Uh, but I think our number of transactions which are happening is far lower than expected it's only about you know million transaction for the entire year kind of right so it's it's very very less number of transactions so the adoption is a problem so i see there is an opportunity there uh, for banks as well as the individuals especially to drive those transactions i think there is a some unique cultural and a sri lankan problem to be solved uh, in that digital, because digital, as I started saying, digital means uh, different things to different people. So we need to find out what Sri Lanka's uh, digital transaction economy is all about, uh, especially when it comes to QR based payment. So I think that problem we need to solve it. Uh, and so that's an opportunity that I see uh, from a financial services perspective. But uh, of course, there are few remains few challenges uh, in particular to uh, certain um, regulatory frameworks need to be evolved and supported in terms of uh, for forming digital transaction because the fear factor comes when it is digital, uh, the, especially the cyber security remains uh, a critical concerns with the banks and with the people also. And then fraudulent transaction, whether we have a mechanism of recovery or, or complaining and getting it sorted out uh, is a bit of an issue. And then, of course, we have a bit of an aging population in Sri Lanka. So how do we solve digital for them is a critical aspect that we need to look at. So these are the few challenges I see 
in terms of adopting digital, especially in the bank- banking and financial services sector. Mr. Taz, when we look at how banking and financial services are transforming digitally, we see that there is a shift from a more operational perspective into a customer-centric approach. Uh, Can you share some insights about this? Yeah, I think the first is what is digital, right? So digital means uh, uh, transforming your products and services fully from a customer-oriented perspective or customer-centric perspective, because uh, that's the that's where the ultimate digital means, where that you your your yourself is enjoying the services and the products by consuming on your own. So it's a more of a self-service driven uh, aspect. So if you want to service your customers without a human intervention or assistance, human assistance. Uh, and from a product discovery uh, to pr- onboarding to enjoying that entire journey of the customer journey needs to be understood by uh, whether it's a banking sector company or whoever the company who wants to be uh, uh, be digitally transformed. So therefore, the customer centricity or, or is the most important thing when it comes to digital. Uh, so that's why I think uh, if you look at uh, if I may talk about the banking sector, so the, traditionally the banking uh, was focused on the products in terms of how do you get when you when a customer comes, how do you give him a loan, how do you give him a savings product, how do you give him a credit card, or how do you do the loan underwriting? Uh, that's that was the focus, and and there was an interaction with the customer in order to do that. But today the banking is uh, embedded into the products right so when you buy a product today uh, you will see you don't know whether you're getting a loan but it will be financed through a loan uh, uh, through the bank or through your finance company uh, for that product so it it has become the satisfying the customer's need at that point of time that he wants not as applying for a loan and getting a loan so that differentiation is happening uh, especially with the fintechs uh, driving that innovation and the fintech companies are more towards a customer centric uh, compared to a traditional company traditional mm-hmm. bank so therefore all this is driving towards uh, the organizations to be customer centric rather than process and a product centric right so that's that's a change which in in my view which is happening so I think if you if today any organization wants to uh, service the customers through digitally, I think they need to have uh, put the customer into the center and understand their needs and try to fulfill their their needs through their products and services uh, in the long run. Mr. Dice, if I ask you, in some sectors, we see that uh, customer needs and wants drive product and service innovations. But when we look at uh, financial services, we see that it's a little different where sector players are driving innovation and customers are following suit. Um, can you explain this? Yeah, I think traditionally, yes. And the traditional banking is like that, in my view, right? I think that has been, I mean, uh, that has still not transformed to a great extent right that's why i said that today if you look at the banking services i think there is a very famous uh, statement by uh, uh, mr bill gates saying uh, banking is necessary but the banks are not all right that was mentioned in 30 almost 30 35 years ago but i say it in a slightly different way even though the banking is required but now banking is getting invisible and it's hidden and to the products and services. Now, today, if you go and when you're buying a product, you will be asked whether you want to pay this through a, a installment, right? Uh, and uh, probably with your card or even a bank not getting involved in it. You don't know which bank is providing that. It could be a fintech who's providing that service where that you will buy now and pay it later or pay it in installments. So that's a traditional bank in products that which we call it as a loan, but it has it has gone to satisfy the customer's need and driven by the customer's requirement. So it is uh, going there from digital perspective. And one other aspects that we need to take into account today is I think the topic of artificial intelligence is being spoken a lot. 
but ai and today the banks and the banking uh, especially the bank and banking uh, fi uh, financial services sector is transforming with digital and ai together so it's it's more or less i i wouldn't say that today uh, it's only enough to transform yourself with digital but i think digital and ai transformation is the key for almost all the sectors uh, in 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 today's context it's time to take a very short break but we'll soon be back to talk more about digital transformation what makes a truly awesome insurance company is it the skills to manage big numbers and big responsibilities well that's definitely part of it but there's more it's the people they are awesome super passionate about looking out for others and putting in their time for people's finances it's not just the people it's how we do things that's awesome from being trend setters of the industry to being connectors or inventors it's about well-being and how we achieve it our teams hustle non-stop to meet the needs of the people that's why we are on the rise but it's not just about how we do things either it's about how we improve things helping our clients thrive in a world that's full of awesome goals to achieve making the maximum out of the minimum but wait there's more to it there's one last thing that truly makes an insurance company awesome it's that we care about our people and our customers all of this combined it's been a pretty awesome year and we're excited for tomorrow display your brand message on digital screens at prime locations at prime locations the largest digital advertising network in sri lanka in sri lanka emerging media Welcome back to the show. We're in conversation with the chairman of LOSE Finance and founder of Lanka iPay. Mr. Dais, you mentioned many challenges that we have to overcome and also uh, opportunities to make use of. But for anything and everything, we need people to drive it. So when we look at the available talent in digital enabled sectors in Sri Lanka, uh, what is your assessment? What are our strengths and, of course, areas to improve as well? I think. Uh... that's a very very important question right so i think if you really look at it in today's context what has happened now with the entire global economy is opening up for all the talents and then with this the with the pandemic that we all got used to working from home and working from anywhere right so the digital channel is becoming a global talent right so there are there are positives as well as negatives in this right so if you really look at it from a sri lankan talent perspective i think sri lanka as a country has been cultivating a very robust pool of talent uh, in the past and that's why the the it sector was doing very well uh, and of course the software engineers to developers to it professionals uh have been there in the market for a quite a long period of time and there are a lot of universities producing uh, private universities semi government universities who are producing it uh talent uh of course uh the sector uh is as as i mentioned is competing globally it's always uh, a challenge in terms of retaining these uh individuals i think the brain drain as we experience in the last couple of years with the economic conditions and various uh, challenges that we had there was a bit of a brain drain and i think safeguarding these talent i think sri lankan companies needs to focus not only on the sri lankan economy because digital means that you can be uh, a global company you don't need to be a local company of course there are challenges in the banking and financial services sector but otherwise your products can be global your services can be global as long as it's a digitally digitally deliverable 
So therefore, there is an opportunity. So I think that if you want to retain the talent, Sri Lankan talent, I think we need to be a global company and earning global, uh, having a global footprint, which will enable to retain the talent that we have. Having said that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the global, the digital talent is is a bit of a problem globally as well, uh, because today. Uh, this the they are demanding not uh, local salaries they are demanding more of a global salary right and uh, global perks because they can they can work from Sri Lanka to a US company it's only a time difference that they have to do so I know there are so many people who are working like that in the Sri Lankan context earning uh, US dollars from Sri Lanka so uh, similarly if you are an organization who's focusing seriously on the digital forefront. I think your, your talent access is not local, it's global as well. There are many places that you can access global talent. Uh, so I think that's something that uh, uh, the companies need not worry about, but of course at the right price, uh, you will be able to access to a, uh, enough and more talent, especially from the large pools of from India, to China, to various other countries, uh, having a good uh, large pools of digital talent. Uh, however, there's room for improvement, uh, particularly in terms of advanced digital skills, and especially on the AI and the data science. And, and of course, uh, as I mentioned, which is the problematic area, the cybersecurity side also needs to uh, be focused and there is an improvement needed in the talent uh, and a very strong foundations are required uh, for upskilling and reskilling the workforce. So I think one of the key things that we need to do is uh, we need to reskill and upskill the existing work workforce in order to adopt digital as well as be with digital. Uh, today, the technology is democratized to a great extent. So therefore, I think it's a matter of the willingness that you need to have in terms of upskilling and reskilling. Mr. Nice, it's been a delightful conversation, but we are unfortunately nearing the end. But before we let you go, like you mentioned, technology is accessible and um, it's always to do with the adaptation and, of course, being on board with the changes that are inevitable when we talk of digital transformation. So when we look at organizations that are, you know, consistently on a journey of, you know, enabling digitally driven change, um, we come into the area of the importance of culture. So how do you think that organizations should uh, really nurture cultures in such a way that they can adapt to the quick and sometimes disruptive nature of digital technology? Okay, I think fundamentally the first thing is the leadership, right? So I think if, uh, if any organization wants to be, if they say that they want to transform digitally or they want to focus on digitally, I think first thing is that the leadership needs to uh, embrace the digital transformation first, because without the leadership, I think uh, it's very difficult to uh, look at a transformational journey, any form of a transformational journey. That's uh, one of the key things that I see in, in order to be successful. Uh, of course, uh, then the second thing is, I think uh, the as an organization, you need to focus on agility, right? Uh, you you touch on the point saying that, you know, change is in, inevitable and it is happening. The technology is changing. There are so many things which are happening. So in order to adapt that change, in order to be, uh, be favorable to change, I think one of the uh, organization's cultural aspect is uh, in terms of how do you build the agility of the organization. Whether you are big or small, you need to have that agility in the organization. When I say agility, is uh, there are two things. Number one is uh, the culture of innovation, whether the people will try to innovate without a fear of failing. Because failure is something that you need to adopt when you are in innovation. So you need to look at uh, the, you, shall, you can't be feared that I will fail and therefore I don't want to innovate, but you need to start innovation. So the innovation culture has to be built into the organization uh, in order to have that agility. 
so that's the number one uh, thing then uh, the other thing is, is basically the with the innovation which comes is uh, basically adoption of those innovations with a cross functional collaboration because i don't think uh, digital can be done in a siloed manner traditionally most of the organization is a highly structured traditional uh, hierarchical as well as very structured silos of operation we have but if you want to solve a problem of a customer and in digital means solving the customer's problem you need to look at the end to end uh, from customer's journey perspective so that customer's journey touches the entire organization it's not only the marketing it's not only the finance it's not only the operation it's the entire journey so the collaboration uh, with a cross functional approach is very very important and that's a culture that we need to build in so these are some of the factors which are not present in a traditional organization they are very siloed based uh, uh, companies and another thing especially as i mentioned digital has to go hand in hand with the ai and artificial intelligence that means that we need to look at more of a data driven culture and, and you need to solve problems with the data and data driven decision making is a very important so that's a culture another cultural aspect that you need to bring it to the organization and so information or a data driven decision making Uh, is a very very uh, important uh, aspect that we need to look at and of course uh, sometimes one of the other aspects that we forget is actually uh, when always when 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 it comes to digital uh, most of the time the organizations or the employees feel that means you know i'm i'm out of the scene i'm out of the equation so i think employee well being and as i mentioned earlier upskilling them and reskilling them and focusing them on the right path in terms of facing their career path uh, is very very important i think that's something that uh, that needs to be uh, established in the organization we've been in conversation with the chairman of loic finance and founder of ipa conrad dais mr dais it was absolutely lovely to have you on our show Thank you very much for having me and I hope that I did justice to your requirements in terms of fulfilling your objectives and it's great to be with LMD TV thank you very much for having me Stay tuned for a segment of Bizwire coming up after the break The latest issue of Living is available at lmdmall.lk You can also access the digital version on Press Reader Maxter our social media platforms and WhatsApp Welcome back to the show and to another episode of Bizwire. Today the topic of conversation is tea and sustainability. And with me I have the CEO of the company uh, Mr. Almas Marika. Welcome to the show. And I have the Director of Sustainability and Research and Development Dr. Fazida Bandara. Welcome. Um let's start off the conversation by giving our audience a little bit of an idea about how your company looks at sustainability because it's a buzzword today uh and we're seeing it means different things to different people so uh, dr bandar if i can ask you to share the organization's ethos about sustainability and what why is it important to bhagwan thala yeah uh, if i start like this uh, <clears throat> sustainability is important for bhagwan thala because uh, we produce sustainable teas for our consumers and our stakeholders uh, the importance of sustainable tea is it can deliver environmental social and economic aspects and uh, benefits for the all the participants along the value chain imagine uh, if you are having a cup of tea that not only tastes great but also it contribute positively to the environment and the society that's the bhagwan thala tea So Bogantala our sustainability policy or the philosophy is based on the three Ps of sustainability so we strictly follow the three Ps of sustainability in our operations from uh, field where we cultivate our teas to the point of marketing we practice Bogantala our sustainability policy 
which is supported by 45 impact drivers and 135 key performance indicators. Each and every aspects or the operational levels what we are practicing at our uh, the company level. This holistic approach ensure that all our actions benefit for the people and protect the environment and drive the economic success. In addition to that, sustainability is in our heart of every action we do because we believe that it's our responsibility to protect our future. In essence, Bhagavantala commitment for sustainability not only safeguard our business aspects or the business purposes, but also it role as a, or it support for uh, the work as a responsible corporate citizen in this world. That's a lovely introduction. I love that you said that it's at the heart of what you do. Um, uh, Mr. Marika, um, Dr. Banda was talking about like multiple stakeholders being impacted and it's, it's a very holistic operation. Uh, I would like to talk about the first and I would say one of the most important stakeholders, the customer. Um, how does your uh, adoption of sustainability and your philosophy of sustainability really influence your customer experience? Yes. So there are five main differentiators which uh, we add value to uh, our consumers. First, the Bhagavantala region itself is situated in a perfect ideal elevation, which is ranging from 4,000 feet to 6,000 feet, which is perfect for a cup of tea. And the flavor of the tea is simply is unmatched from any of the rest of the Ceylon tea. I think uh, it's called the Golden Valley. <laughs> exactly, it's called the Golden Valley of Ceylon tea. And second, we are the pioneers in climate positivity, which means we are the only brand that has been certified in growing, manufacturing and marketing tea, which impacts the environment positively. Third, we have over 500 different teas, flavors, herbals and infusions, which is unparalleled. And we customize to the end consumer. Fourth, we have exceptional tea masters and our young and dynamic team who ensure excellent service, customer service. And lastly, with our work in market research, brand positioning and new product development, we become a total value chain partner to our private labels and our own brands like the limited edition uh, uh, Bhagavantala range and the brand Ceylon Tea Gardens. Thank you, Mr. Marika. So I think customers get much more than a simple cup of tea. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about, you know, something external uh, impact of sustainability. Um, if I can ask you, Dr. Bandara, can you share with us some of the recent sustainability related initiatives taken by Bukavantalava Teas and how they kind of impact the company's operations, profitability, as well as external communities as well? Yeah, absolutely. Bogandala has embarked on a series of impactful sustainability initiatives within the company as well as outside the company in recent years, showcasing an unwavering commitment to environmental stewardship, social accountability and effective governance. Among those initiatives, uh, I can highlight you that uh, working with renewable energy, energy management, ecosystem preservation, uh, sustainable soil development, biodiversity conservation, climate change and mitigation, uh, fair uh, labor uh, practices, then community development, then women empowerment, uh, transparency, traceability and many more other initiatives. That's a long we can day. discuss, it will take <laughs> one day to discuss those things, right? But uh, among those initiatives, I would like to highlight you that Bhagavantala is the world first the growing manufacturing and marketing company certified for carbon neutral certification, climate positive certification, 100% renewable certification, we call it uh, net zero energy certification, as well as climate neutral certification, which was awarded by the CNG, climate neutral group in Netherlands. Uh, we, we, we received that certificate recently. In addition to our internal initiatives, we work with uh, national sustainability programs and collaborations with government organizations, NGOs and international organizations to give our contribution to the sustainability in a broad angle. 
and we are complied with this uh, United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and we are actively committed to sustainable tea plantation management. Uh, finally, what I want to highlight you as a reasonable achievement is Bhogwantala always focus on uh, the leading the sustainability initiatives by giving the examples for our community and improving the benchmark and others to follow us. Um, I'm very, I mean, that's a lot of certifications. I'm, I'm not going to ask you about everything. Uh, but if we can talk about the most recent one, uh, the climate positive uh, certification, can you just give us an explanation of what this means and what made Bhagavan Dhalavati's acquire this? Uh, then if I start, uh, if I give an answer for your second half of the question, yes. Bhagavan Dhalav sustainability initiatives have, uh, have revolutionized our company performances in several ways and uh, giving us the tangible benefits such as uh, enhancement of company operational performances and cultivation of conductive work environments then enhance the company productivity as well as profitability, worker satisfaction and the stakeholder engagement fortifying our long-term sustainability and competitiveness in the market. Those are the, you know, the, the best gain for the company for ultimate sustainability initiatives. Definitely, definitely. Wow. So much of things to talk about. Uh, but I'm going to ask you like one thing that was really of interest to me. Uh, you spoke about the recent certification, the climate positive certification. Uh, can you tell me what this what this means and why Bhagavan Talavati was able to acquire this? Yeah, uh, I'll give a little bit background for this certification and I'll explain you about the climate positive certification. We started this journey in 2010 with the key objective of contributing to minimize greenhouse gas emission from our value chain and contribute to the manage global warming as a responsible tea uh, company. Then uh, in 2016, Bogandala was awarded as a world first tea growing manufacturing and marketing company offering uncompensated carbon neutral teas from our uncompensated carbon neutral facilities. We were certified for both product as well as facilities. Then we didn't stop at that level. We continuously invested and we did continuous our research and development and innovations. As a result, in 2019, Bogantala was certified as the world first climate positive tea company. The uniqueness of this uh, certificate is we have not purchased carbon credits. I think you may have heard about that carbon credits or GHG emission reduction from outside market. But most of companies practice, they just prepare a carbon balance sheet and purchase carbon credits from outside sources and they say that they are carbon neutral or climate positive. We believe that that's not a sustainability. We practice our uncompensated carbon neutral offsetting or we call it insetting process. The world is moving now with the insetting process because it has the real sustainability. So we practice that. So that's one uniqueness of Bhagavan Talaba. In addition to that, to generate our required carbon credits, we have invested significantly for different projects such as renewable energy development, hydropower, solar power, all our factory roofs are equipped with the state-of-the-art solar systems. So that's how we have achieved the 100% renewable certification or net zero energy certification as well. And we practice energy management throughout our value chain. And we practice integrated nutrition management program, waste management, water management, packing management, and climate smart agriculture, regenerative agriculture practices. There are so many initiatives. We are implementing those initiatives and through those initiatives only we have achieved our climate positive standards. So we have complied according to the international standards and our balance sheet have been verified by the auditors, certified and then only we were awarded the climate positive status for the Bhagavan Talawa. That's the uniqueness. So in finally, what I want to highlight you is Bhagavan Talawa hold the world highest level of sustainability standard including fair trade, rainforest, organic, this climate positive and the, whatever you call highest level of sustainability certificate, Bhagavan Tala hold it. And the company hold the essence 
and the immense significance from these certifications and it enhanced our credibility and the reputation while reassuring our customers, consumers, stakeholders and partners of our commitment to the sustainability. That's the uniqueness of Bogantara. Lovely. I, I love the concept of insetting. I think that's the first time I've heard of it. Thank you very much for sharing, uh, Dr. No Mandara. Uh, Ms. Marika, I want to ask you about something that was mentioned in the previous answer, actually. Uh, all of these certifications, all of these unique practices are huge differentiators when you look at your market uh, competitiveness. Um, can you take me through how your commitment to sustainability at Bhagavan Thalavati's has really differentiated you in the marketplace and improving your competitiveness, not only I mean, on, on a global scale? Yes, uh, if you look at the world today, the rest of the world, their governments as well as the, the corporations, they are in a race to zero which means their plan is to become carbon neutral by either 2030 or to become carbon neutral by 2040. As Dr. May mentioned earlier, at Bhagwantala, we became carbon neutral in 2017 and we became climate positive in 2019. This is a very unique position to be in. And we are so proud about this accomplishment of becoming the world's first climate positive tea growing, manufacturing and marketing company that gives a total product from growing up to the shelf and up to the cup. So this is a very unique opportunity for the consumer where every cup they drink from, from Bhagavan Talawa has a positive impact on the environment. No other brand can offer this. So this has given us a great competitive edge. Wow, lovely. Thank you very much, Mr. Marika, for talking to us about how it impacts your competitiveness. I'm going to also um, uh, direct my last question to you. Um, this is kind of like a devil's advocate question. You see, we hear about a lot of companies, especially tea companies, who say that they are sustainable. Uh, but like what we were hearing from Dr. Bandara, you know, uh, there's offsetting versus insetting. So when you look at where you are placed and how other companies position themselves. Can you take me through the thought process here and also share your thoughts on how we should really encourage the entire industry to adopt a more healthy stance on sustainability like what Bokaman Thalavad is? Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, we are not competing with any other tea companies. We compete with ourselves. We exceeded our carbon neutrality by becoming climate positive. So there may be a lot of companies call themselves environment friendly but no one can call themselves climate positive. So pioneering climate positivity took a lot of hard work and strategy. So today Bhagavantala is the only brand that can back this claim with facts and figures on a global stage. So this capability was built on the philosophy of our chairman, Mr. Dinesh Ambani, and the efforts of our director, Dr. Tushita Bandara, which led us to achieving this coveted position. Perfect. And that's a beautiful story and it's been so uh, interesting hearing about this. I have so many questions but we unfortunately have very little time. So uh, thank you very much to the CEO of Bhagavan Thalavatis, uh, Mr. Almas Marika. Thank you for yes. being a part of our show. And of course, thank you to the Director of Sustainability and Research and Development, Dr. Tuzida Bandara. It was lovely to take into you. We've been talking about tea and sustainability with Bhagavan Thalawa Plantations today. It was very nice talking to the both of you. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Almas Marika and Dr. Tusta Bandara for being a part of our show. It's been our pleasure and thank you for having us. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Until next time, take care. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and X. Thank you for watching and stay safe.